Hi, and welcome back to Hacker 101. In this session, we're going to talk about secure architecture review. This is particularly relevant to developers and is presented from a defender's and designer's perspective, rather than an attacker perspective. To get started, let's talk about what a secure architecture actually is. My definition of a secure architecture is one that assumes bugs exist and seeks to limit exposure when a compromise happens. This really requires you to accept that all code, no matter how much testing it has undergone, is fallible. From that acceptance, we can help keep attackers from getting to the really good stuff. I personally see this as the other side of the coin from threat modeling. With threat modeling, we look at target value, entry points, and things like that. With secure architecture review, we assume that they're already inside. By way of analogy, if you run a jewelry store, keeping burglars out is only step one. From there, you want to make sure they're caught on camera and that they can't get out of it if they do manage to steal something. I see secure architecture review largely the same way. The process is pretty simple, but it does require a very different thought process than most security activities. You start from the externally facing pieces, web applications, APIs, etc., and then work your way deeper inside your system from there. For each component, you begin by assuming that it is compromised. What then can an attacker get from this point, directly? That is, without hopping to another host. Can they access credentials? Can they access source code? What about user data? Consider what would happen if they got in and bugged your code to send credentials or credit card information out to their own server. Once you've figured that out, you need to make a judgment call. Does this data need to be here, or can it live on another server further away from the outside? For that matter, does it need to exist at all? That last part is really about isolation. If your goal is to limit attacker access, what better way is there than simply making sure there's minimal data to access in the first place? With all of this, we're assuming that everything on your network can be compromised, but that doesn't mean they're going to get in instantly. If your web server and database server are sitting on the same host, split those up. That's one more hop an attacker has to compromise before they can get to the juicy data. If you have multi-tenant systems, for instance, an enterprise application where each customer is a company with multiple users, with no interaction between the separate company instances, then this is especially true. Each of these applications should be unable to communicate with the other's database instances by means of having separate database credentials for each one. Also, putting these applications into a container like Docker will allow a single instance to fall to an attacker without all of them falling at once. Bear in mind, none of this requires separate hardware, just a bit of clever design and DevOps magic. This is one of the things I repeat most in the course, but passwords should never be in plain text or hashed with MD5, SHA-1, and the like. You might as well just post your user's passwords out on the web for all the good it does. We have a whole video on storing passwords securely, which covers this in greater detail, but the summary is, use bcrypt or scrypt. Then, if an attacker gets their hands on these hashes, there's very little they can do with them. The principle of least privilege is applicable in many situations, but secure architecture is a big one. This principle says that each user or service should only be able to access the things it needs to do its job, and nothing more. So your web server should be running as an ultra-low privilege user, your connection to the database shouldn't be using a root user, which is astoundingly common, and in fact the database shouldn't have a root user at all. Finally, and possibly most importantly, we need to discuss auditability. We need to be able to tell when a compromise happens, prevent that attacker from getting further into our system, and get an understanding of what they actually accessed. To do this, I recommend having a centralized logging system entirely separate from every other service on your network, which only gets incoming log messages from everything else. Access to this machine should be limited only to ultra-trusted members of your company as this is one of the most critical pieces of your security infrastructure. You should be logging any requests that cause an internal server error, any failed queries, any shell commands running as the web server or database users, and any non-expected attempt to connect out from any of your servers. This is a minimal list, but even just logging these few things can greatly increase your odds of catching and shutting down attacks. For instance, sudden query failures are likely to indicate someone with a SQL injection bug, trying to figure out exactly how to exploit it. But, it's important to realize that even this can't be completely trusted. 
An attacker may compromise the logging system, may find a way to block the other machines from sending log messages, may inundate you with false log messages to hide the real ones, or other things. This audit log is a huge help, but it's only one piece in the defense in depth that a secure architecture will help you build. Again, I have to reiterate, if you want your system to hold up to attack, you need to treat it like any part of it can fail at any time. When Netflix wanted to make sure that their production systems were resilient to non-security outages, they created a tool called Chaos Monkey that would automatically take down production machines. This let them ensure that things at least limped along, even in the worst case. Think of Secure Architecture Review as the Chaos Monkey for your data security. As always, thanks for watching and happy breaking.